and this time change all the time. I think if they took it on, on the Sunday morning in churches, the, the, the morning after it happens, it would probably pass. Uh, welcome to God's worship. Yes, sir. Well, yes. <laughs> yes. I don't know if it ever has, but I don't remember. But anyway, welcome to worship this morning. And uh, uh, my prayer is that it doesn't end like last week's worship. And I do want to uh, to thank those of you who showed your support and all of the prayers. That uh, it makes a lot of difference. It really does. Uh, I know we can't jump up and hug one another, but uh, just turn around and give a wave to the other folks here, letting you know that you're okay with having them here to worship with you. Yeah. All right. We continue with our first hymn, Tis Good Lord to Be Here. and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We confess our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your temporal and present punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We read responsibly the psalm. <clears throat> oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from trouble. 
and gathered in from the land. Some wandered in desert waste, finding no way to a city to dwell. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way, till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We continue with our next hymn. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. And though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our first reading.
fourth Sunday in Lent is from Numbers chapter 21. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom and the, and the people became impatient on the way and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there is no food and no water and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. <clears throat> the epistle is from Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air and spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in which, and being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages. He might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and abounding in steadfast love. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out to God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated as we sing, By Grace I am Saved.
epistle for today. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in death. This is our text. Grace, mercy, and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know the story of Adam and Eve's fall into sin. God gave them one commandment, that shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you recall what their response was after they had eaten from the tree and after they had realized that they had sinned against God? Did they go to church and confess their sins and wait to hear words of forgiveness? They did? Oh, they hid. Yeah, that's one, one little consonant there can make the difference in a word. And yes, they hid. And they tried to cover up by making themselves garments of fig leaves. That would be very efficient, wouldn't it? The, the point is, they did not choose to go to God. They did not confess their sins. Uh, and you know, that's not uncommon, is it? I don't know if you've been watching the news lately, but you might recall that at least one politician who has refused to absolutely even consider that he has done anything wrong. And that's, that's not uncommon either. I mean, that's something that we see a lot. And the sad thing is that we often try to cover up. Do you really want people to know what you really think? Do you really want them to know everything you've ever done? Would you feel comfortable coming up in front of the congregation this morning and confessing some things that you have never shared with anyone else? Probably not. And so as sinful beings, we tend to want to cover up our fault. We want to convince others that we are better than we are, that we're something different than what we really are. And sometimes we go to such great lengths to do that that we even convince ourselves that we're not as bad as we could be. So we kind of excuse ourselves sometimes. But there's a problem with this. The problem with not admitting sinfulness is that then there seems to be no reason to repent. If we can convince ourselves that we're not so bad, then we have no need to repent. If we have no need to repent, we have no need for forgiveness. And that leads to us not repenting, and that means to not being forgiven. Now many of the people that St. Paul was speaking to in our text this morning they were what we refer to as Gentile Christians. They were not Jews. They were not raised and taught the law that the Jewish people were taught. That was part of their covenant with God, that they would keep the commandments, that they would do what was right. And St. Paul came to these people and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
You're saved not by your works. You're saved because Jesus Christ suffered and died for you and he forgives you all your sins. That was the message that he taught there. But after St. Paul had left for a while, you know, he would start these preaching stations. He would leave. He would come back. Well, after Paul had started the congregation initially, some of the Jewish leaders began to teach, well, yes, it's true. It's true that Jesus Christ came and died for you, suffered and rose again, but you still have to keep the law. You still have to do something to earn your salvation. And so these people were confused, and that's why St. Paul preached as he did in the letter this morning that we read. You know, he emphasized to the people, you know, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. You, you couldn't do anything because you were dead. You had no ability to, to even want to turn to God. God had to come to you. And the truth is, we too, I think we admit that, we were dead in our trespasses and sin. We were born sinful, and we're still sinners. We admit that. Before we could be acceptable to God, we had to be redeemed, and we couldn't redeem ourselves. So God promised and sent his son, Jesus Christ. And Paul describes this really beautifully in our, ta in our uh, reading this morning, our epistle reading. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And then he inserts there, you know, by grace you were saved. But if you read it and just leave that out, I don't know if you've ever... Uh, really looked at some of St. Paul's writings, but I challenge you to read some of his epistles and then try to diagram his sentences because they go on and on and on. And so in this one, I'm going to leave out that phrase and read this because to me it, it carries. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. Paul writes that as if it's already true. He doesn't say Christ, Christ will make us alive. He said he has made us alive together with him. He has raised us up with him. He has seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness. Well, that makes it a done deal. Paul is saying, this is not something you're still striving for. This is not something you're still hoping for. It's a done deal. And eventually, he's going to show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's when we will find complete fulfillment when he actually takes us to live with himself and his Father and the Holy Spirit for eternity. Now, we did nothing to bring this about. And I'm going to read the first part of the text again. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. So you do not have to wonder if you've done enough. Christ has done enough. The Holy Spirit, through the Word, the sacrament of baptism, 
brings you to faith. He has done enough. And as long as we keep that God-given faith, we can be sure that our sins are forgiven, that we are, we are okay with God. He is okay with us. Now that, that pretty much settles the matter of being saved from the guilt of sin. But in these three verses that I chose for our text, the last verse is sometimes overlooked. It goes like this. For we are, create, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we know for sure that we've been saved from sin. But do we give much thought to what we are saved for? Usually we think in terms of, well, I'm saved and I'm just waiting for heaven. Well, God didn't save us just so we could wait around here for Jesus to come and take us to heaven. If that were the case, as soon as we became a believer, he could snap us up there and be all right. But he says, no. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, with God, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do you ever recall singing in our offertory, taken from Psalm 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And then this last part. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Christianity offers much more than simply coming to worship on Sunday morning for an hour or so, maybe a Bible study, a token offering, prayer before meals, and then going about our business. I say Christianity offers more than that. It doesn't require more, but it offers more. Have you ever noticed that, that it seems that the people who most willingly give of their time and of their talents and, and, and always seems to be finding something good to do for someone else, that they seem to be more satisfied with life? They seem to be happier people. How many of you, and I want you to be honest in this now, okay, this is a test for your honesty. How many of you have ever thought, boy, if I could only win one of those lotteries and, and win about $500 million, I would have it made. Anybody ever thought that? You're trying to hide it. <laughs> I'd like to read something to you that to me illustrates that wealth, material goods, does not bring satisfaction in life. I read this recently about Steve Jobs. For those of you who don't remember, he was the founder of Apple. He died back in 2011 of pancreatic cancer. Shortly before he died, these are reportedly some of his last words. I reached the pinnacle of success in the business world. My life is an epitome of success. However, aside from work, I have little joy. In the end, wealth is only a fact of life that I am accustomed to. 
Lying on the sick bed and recalling my whole life, I realized that all the recognition and wealth that I took so much pride in have paled and become meaningless in the face of impending death. Now, to me, that's a very sad comment. Here's a man who had more worldly goods than most of us can even imagine having. And yet, when it came time for him to leave this life, he felt that it was all for naught. And the sad part is I couldn't find anything that would indicate that he turned to God and Jesus Christ as his Savior before his death. So while worldly, he had everything. In eternity, he has nothing. See, God has prepared good works that we should walk in them. Another survey. How many of you think God loves you? At least three this time. Yeah. You're getting better. Losing your shyness. How many of you think God has your best interest in mind? A few more. Yeah, so if he has your best interest in mind, don't you think it makes sense that when he gives us guidance in his word, that he does that so that living according to his word, his commandments, we in turn will find life more satisfying, more rewarding, and help us give a greater joy in the salvation that we know we have. Christianity is more than a belief. Christianity is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle in everything we do. We don't go out of church and say, well, I got my Christianity stuff done. Now I can go back and fuss about my job, and, you know, fight with wife or whatever. No. Christianity means we live as children of God, not because God demands it for him, but because God wants what's best for us. So that joy that's not found in the material things of life, God wants you to have. He wants to have that joy that comes from living our lives in response to the blessings that he has given us, not in an attempt to earn more. So discover what God has saved you for, and you will more likely discover the joy of the Lord's salvation. Amen. Now may the peace that passes understanding keep your hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Confess our faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> We bring our hearts together in prayer to God. Dear Heavenly Father, with thankful hearts, we come together for worship this morning, remembering your promise that where two or three are gathered together in your name, you are present. And we seek and welcome your presence with us, Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we are tired and impatient with dealing with this COVID pandemic. And we, thank, we are thankful for the vaccines that are available to give us hope. Receive our thanks, not only for the hope that we might see an end to COVID, but also for the sure hope we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Dear God, it is with joy that we hear your words of forgiveness assuring us that in Jesus Christ we look forward to eternal life with you. But you also reveal to us that you expect us to do good works that you have prepared for us. May your Holy Spirit reveal to us and lead us in the activities that would have us do. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, there's so much unrest in our country. So much division because of conflicting political views. We know you call Christians to seek unity with one another. And that true unity is found only in Jesus Christ. May we have a zeal for seeking unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And may that also bring unity to our nation. Lord, in your mercy. We see around us much evidence that as a country we have abandoned your ways. May we and all Christians with us raise our voices that those who oppose you and your ways might be exposed to your word and be led to see their need for a Savior. And may your Holy Spirit work faith in their hearts that they may learn that Jesus Christ is that Savior that they need. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we look to you as the great healer. And we trust that you know and love us no matter our need, whether it be physical or emotional. Help us that we might feel genuine concern for those on our prayer list and others who need healing. Lord, help us to be faithful when we say to someone, I'll pray for you. Help us to be aware of those around us that we could make their day better simply by a kind word or a friendly smile. And Lord, while we trust you to be healers of our physical and emotional ills, we also trust that you would heal us in our grief. Especially those who have lost family and friend to COVID, to Yvonne's family as they mourn her passing. Lord, be with us and help us to be with others. Lord, in your mercy. These and all of our prayers we offer in the name of our Lord and Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As you receive the blessing this morning, 
I would have you realize that the blessing is not from me. This is the blessing that God directed Aaron to speak to his people. And that's why we use it as our blessing when we bless one another, especially as we prepare to leave the worship service and go out and lead our Christian lives in the public. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. bless you all.